Hi, everyone. I'm Uri Cohen, and along with Chris Farrar, we are happy to present our research for the December edition of the MRM Highlights. In chemical exchange saturation transfer, CEST, an off-resonant saturation pulse can be used to saturate a group of labile or exchangeable protons. Those protons can then exchange with the water protons, and that leads to a measurable reduction in the water signal. In this way, fast chemical exchange can act as a saturation amplifier so that even low concentrations of a CEST agent can be detected. Conventionally, the CEST signal is measured by sequentially exciting the magnetization with an off-resonant pulse at successive resonance offsets, and that's done to generate what's known as the Z-spectrum. When the offset equals the resonant frequency of the exchangeable protons, the water signal is reduced for that offset. And this is typically quantified by subtracting the signal of the positive offsets from that of the negative offsets to obtain what's known as the MTR asymmetry or the magnetization transfer ratio asymmetry. The interesting thing about the CES contrast is that it depends on the chemical exchange rate, which is pH sensitive, and on the labile proton volume fraction, which is sensitive to protein and metabolite concentrations. This sensitivity of CES to pH and to protein metabolite concentrations turns out to be a very powerful tool for imaging a whole range of pathologies. For example, the endogenous amide proton CES contrast has been used to detect changes in pH during stroke, which may provide insight into the viability of the ischemic penumbra. It's also been used to distinguish tumor progression from radiation necrosis in clinical glioma patients. Similarly, the amine proton test contrast has been used to measure changes in brain glutamate concentrations in neurodegenerative diseases, and also used to measure creatine concentrations in the heart that may be predictive of heart failure. More recently, exogenous CES reported genes have been described for imaging therapeutic viruses in oncolytic virotherapy. So clearly CEST is a very promising technique. One of the issues with the CEST contrast is that it depends on many different factors, none of which are actually quantified in the CEST spectrum. So the contrast changes that are observed are qualitative, not quantitative. And in addition, CES requires long acquisition times to get the full Z spectrum, something on the order of 10 minutes or more. And finally, the, the large number of exchangeable pools really complicates the data analysis. So there's, there's still a need for a faster and more specific and particularly quantitative CES method. MR fingerprinting is a recently developed technique that can theoretically provide the quantitative tissue maps that we want. Just to explain the concept, let's, let's use an analogy. So in a crime scene, a fingerprint can provide information on the subject if it matches an entry in a previously compiled database. For instance, in this case, the fingerprint belongs to my collaborator, Chris Farrar, and it immediately gives us a whole host of information about him. The idea in MR fingerprinting is that by varying the acquisition parameters, we can cause a signal from different tissue types to be unique. But first we need to build the database or a dictionary for all possible tissue parameter combinations. And then after we acquire the data, the signal that we acquire can be matched to the dictionary in order to determine the corresponding tissue parameter values. Normally, in conventional MRF, we would use the block equations to build a dictionary. But in CEST MRF, because we have to account for the exchange between the different proton pools, the model has to be modified, and what we use instead are the block McConnell equations. To build a dictionary, we used an acquisition schedule that varied the saturation power randomly for 30 iterations, but we kept the saturation frequency offset fixed. For each set of tissue parameters, we use the Block McConnell simulator to generate the corresponding signal trajectory. And this is how we built our dictionary. To test the SESTMRF method, we used L arginine phantoms with different concentrations and pH. The acquisition schedule that we use had 30 frames or 30 randomly selected saturation powers. And the saturation frequency offset was fixed to the amine 
proton chemical shift, which is 3 ppm. The total scan time for the 30 measurements was only two minutes. The acquired data was matched to a dictionary pixel by pixel using the vector dot product as the pattern matching metric. For each pixel, the set of tissue parameters that gave, gave the highest dot product uh, was assigned to that pixel. One limitation with dictionary matching, however, is that the accuracy is limited to whatever entries are in your dictionary. We tested the reconstruction in L-arginine phantoms that had either a fixed pH and varied concentrations or had a fixed concentration and varied pH. In both cases, the SestemRef correctly quantified both the chemical exchange rate and the L-arginine concentrations. We also quantified the agreement between the reconstructed parameters obtained with SestemRF and those obtained with QuESP, which is an alternative exchange rate quantification method. What we found was that the two methods had excellent agreement between them. And additionally, the dependence of the exchange rate on pH was well modeled by the base catalyzed proton exchange model. Similarly, the concentrations obtained with MRF were significantly correlated with the Nolan concentrations. Going beyond a specific acquisition schedule now, one of the key questions in any MRF experiment, really, is to determine how good the acquisition schedule is in distinguishing between different parameters. In previous work, we proposed to use the correlation between different dictionary entries as a metric for the discrimination of a schedule. To get the correlation between every two elements in the dictionary, we can calculate the dot product matrix. This is nice because it also gives us an optimization target. For instance, the ideal trajectory would result in a dot product matrix that's equal to the identity matrix. In other words, one's on the diagonal and zero's everywhere else. So then the goal of the optimization would be to find the schedule that minimizes the difference between the identity matrix and the given dot product matrix using the Frobenius norm. Calculating the dot product matrix for different exchange rate quantification methods, what we see is that the SestMRF method gives the steepest drop off for the off diagonal entries. And this indicates improved discrimination in comparison to say QuESP or the Z-spectrum acquisition. For in vivo experiments, the two-pool model that we used in reconstructing the phantom data is insufficient because the semi-solid pool also has to be accounted for. So what we do instead is we switch to a three-pool model and that includes exchange between the water, the solute, and the semi-solid pools. And that's what we use to generate the dictionary. We also tested our sequence on an in vivo healthy rat brain. The animal was anesthetized and scanned on a 4.7 Tesla Bruker scanner with a birdcage coil for transmit and four channel phase array for receive. The amide and semi-solid proton volume fraction exchange rates were mapped. And we found good agreement between the amide exchange rates obtained with SestemRF and those obtained with the water exchange spectroscopy method. Also, the semi-solid volume fraction was elevated in white matter in comparison to gray matter, which it also is what we would expect based on previous studies in the literature. So far in the reconstructions, we've been assuming a constant set of relaxation parameters because otherwise the dictionary size, which grows exponentially with the number of parameters, would just be too large. The issue is that in pathologies, the relaxation parameters will also vary. So they definitely have to be included in the dictionary. And this growth in the dictionary affects the dictionary generation clearly, but also the reconstruction. So a new approach is really needed in order to avoid these issues. Therefore, we propose to use our deep learning trained neural network to do the parameter reconstruction. The idea here is to use a neural network to find a functional mapping between the measured data and the underlying quantitative tissue map. In this case, the network consists of an input and output layer and two fully connected hidden layers. 
There are two big advantages to this approach. First, the network can be trained with a sparse dictionary that's much smaller than what would be needed with an equivalent dictionary matching approach. So for instance, in this case, we use the six dimensional dictionary with a million entries to train the network. The second big advantage is that the reconstruction time is almost instantaneous. In this case, it only required 58 milliseconds. To illustrate the importance of mapping the relaxation parameters, we also scanned the middle cerebral artery occlusion rat stroke model with the system RF sequence using two different acquisition schedules. The first schedule only varied the saturation power, whereas the second also varied the flip angle on the TR to enable a greater sensitivity to the relaxation parameters. As you can see, the dictionary reconstruction performed very poorly in reconstructing all parameters, which is uh, somewhat expected for uh, this dictionary given its limited resolution. The neural network approach or drone with the variable saturation power did well on the exchange rate and volume fractions, but poorly on the T1 and T2 maps. On the other hand, the drone with the second schedule resulted in significantly improved relaxation and exchange maps. Some interesting features of the maps that we obtained are the decreased MI proton exchange rate in the stroke lesion, which is consistent with a pH reduction, and the decreased proton volume fractions consistent with decreased meta metabolite concentrations. When we do a side-by-side -side comparison between the drone reconstruction of the SESTEM RF data and traditional dictionary matching, we can see the differences more starkly. For instance, for a schedule length of 30 and a dictionary with about 200,000 entries, the drone preparation time was about eight times smaller and the analysis or reconstruction time was almost 600 times smaller. With a longer schedule of 60 images and a larger dictionary of 2 million entries, the preparation time for the drone was nine times smaller than dictionary matching, but the analysis time was 3,000 times smaller. There are a number of potential improvements to our method that we intend to pursue. First, optimizing the acquisition schedule would facilitate discrimination between different tissue parameters and can therefore improve the accuracy. Also, the current network topology was selected somewhat empirically, and that can probably be optimized as well. The other thing is that we need to make sure that the maps we're getting are actually accurate. So we intend to do extensive validation studies for the different parameters that can be obtained with our method. And finally, we're currently exploring the use of quantitative cess mapping in a number of applications including stroke, cancer, and specifically oncolytic virotherapy. We'd like to end by acknowledging all of our collaborators who contributed to this work, as well as our funding sources, and thank you for your attention.